Hello everybody, my name is James. Welcome back to the second part of our Extreme Torsion Box Assembly Table build. Today we're going to tackle that torsion box from start to finish and then do the drawers. If you decide that this is a project you want to build, we do have a comprehensive set of 3D plans and we actually have those in three different sizes. Uh, this table I'm building here is a 4 foot by 8 foot. We also have a plan size in 3.5 by 7 foot and we have a plan size in 3 foot by 6 foot. So there are three identical tables but in three different sizes and if you're interested we have a link to that in the description below. I wanted to mention that uh, we're actually having a Father's Day sale. I know a lot of you watch our channel and follow our channel and you see uh, me using our, our mallet that we have all the time. It's uh, what we call our King's Fine Woodworking Thor's Hammer Woodworking Mallet. Uh, this particular one is made of Lignum Vitae, which is the densest wood in the world. It's a very rare wood. It's actually not even being imported into the United States anymore. But I have a, a pretty good supply of it. Uh, this is uh, Red Heart, this lumber here. And I have uh, all this wood in quite a variety of species. We, we, we get it in maple, Red Heart. This is African Paduke, Canary Wood. This is a Lignum Head, Purple Heart. This is Bacote. Yeah, this is my favorite lumber of all time here. It's uh, Cocobolo, and, or Cocobolo, I guess, depending on where you're from. It's got different names. And we sell these things in uh, a full size, a mid size, and a micro. And so for Father's Day, I'm actually putting them on the website starting tonight uh, for half price. Uh, so anybody who's interested, the code will just be Father's Day and half price for anybody who wants a mallet for the duration of the sale. The sale will end two days after Father's Day. And that's about it, thanks. Okay, so now we're going to jump right into the build here. Sorry for that blatant advertisement. Uh, our channel doesn't actually carry any sponsors, and so we actually fund the channel entirely by selling plans and, uh, and selling our mallets online. Okay, what I'm doing here is I'm jointing down the edge of a bunch of 2x4s. I think I have about 8 of them total, and I'm getting them completely flat on one side. I picked these out from the, the home center. I think it was a Home Depot, uh, the one that's closest to me and I'm getting completely flat on one side and then I'm going to take them over to my table saw. We are using these guys to create a completely flat and stable surface in order to build the torsion box top. But they don't go to waste once they're done being used to create the top because I use these on the inside as well. Okay so here at the table saw I take the side that came off of the planer, the perfectly flat straight side, and I put that against my fence and I'm going to rip uh, the other side with my table saw. I'm going to rip all of these down to the exact same width. Then we need a couple of sawhorses. I have two of them that have been sitting out in the weather and they've gotten kind of aged and the top is a little bit warped on them, but I'm gonna go ahead and use those anyhow. I'm actually gonna pass them over the top of my jointer. I have very carefully checked them and made sure there was no dirt or dust or anything on them and there's no metal sticking up. You certainly want to, would not want to run this through your jointer if there were metal in the way, but there isn't in mine and we put several hands on it and it went pretty nicely, pretty smoothly over the jointer. Well, my daughter's helping me get this measured out. I'm trying to keep uh, the two ends about the same distance apart, just to keep it roughly square. Doesn't need to be exact. And we're using a level to establish a perfectly flat and level line. So what I'm creating is what's called a strong back. In the, in the boating industry, when somebody creates a boat, which is a wooden boat, something I, I started building a long time ago, uh, the first thing you do is create a strong back, which is a wooden structure that you securely fasten to the ground over whatever the length of the boat is, and then you establish perfect level. So we're doing that one sawhorse at a time. We'll establish it level left to right on one of these two sawhorses, and then I'm going to use hot melt glue in order to stick this to the ground so it doesn't move. If you have a good quality level, you can get a remarkably accurate flat surface. 
but it is very important to make sure all of the legs are securely fastened to the ground so they can't move. We'll be putting quite a bit of weight on them and there'll be quite a bit of shifting as we're working over the next day or so uh, building this torsion box top so we do want it anchored to the ground at each corner. So after we were done leveling the first one we stretched the level out to the second one building up the legs where it was necessary and now we're just kind of doing a final check uh, both my daughters and my oldest uh, or my older daughter's boyfriend there uh, we're checking the level um, on each one individually and then we'll check it on each side and then we'll check some diagonal level as well this is a step that you want to really take your time to get it exactly perfect if you get a quality uh, level and you can look down in it you can pretty easily see if the bubble is dead center or not and if it's not perfect you need to pause and adjust whatever edge needs to be lifted and just go back and forth like that repeatedly until you've achieved it uh, until you've achieved a perfectly flat surface that's really important and we don't want to mess that up here because the future of our torsion box depends on it Once we're satisfied that we've achieved a perfectly flat surface between these two sawhorses, now I'm going to begin putting my two by fours on there. I'm gonna set them down, and they just have to be maybe five or six inches apart, something like that. Um, and I'm gonna secure these things down with hot melt glue on both sides also. I don't want these things to shift around either. And the hot melt glue is really not that expensive. You know, I'd get a whole pack for four or five bucks and use it all. You want to make sure that nothing shifts on you. So what we did is basically we put one two by four on each side and then we spread the others out roughly equidistantly along the middle. And then we went back in and hot melt glued each one down securely. I wanted to mention why it's important to have a torsion box top. Uh, a torsion box top is essentially a top that cannot bend or flex or warp in any way. And if it is built correctly, it will be perfectly flat and it will stay perfectly flat forever. Now this becomes the surface upon which we will assemble and build all of our furniture. And it becomes a reference surface since it is perfect. We can check square from it and parallel from it and it makes assembly much easier and more accurate. It really enhances all aspects of a furniture build and becomes the focal point of your shop. Okay, they're all glued in place and they made great contact and you can see as I'm bringing the camera down here that all of those 2x4s in the back, they disappear and I can only see one 2x4. So we've created a perfectly flat plane here and this is perfect, it's exactly what we needed and now we can move forward with the construction. I'm going to start by ripping my plywood down into strips and these pieces of plywood are going to be the inner webbing pieces that actually create the interior of the torsion box top. That's what gives a, a torsion box top its rigidity. It's kind of like a grid and you'll see what that looks like as we go forward. I plan on joining all of my web pieces together with half lap joinery. I think this is probably the strongest way that this uh, grid could be built. And so the first thing I'm going to do is lay out all of the marks with a pencil and uh, my, my layout tools here. And I'm just going to take my time to take careful measurements of everything. And I really only have to lay them all out once, uh, just on one board, because I'm going to cut them together all at one time. I'm going to use my crosscut sled, and if you don't have a crosscut sled, you might consider building yourself one. It's a very handy tool to have in the shop. Uh, first, I'm going to cut them all to the exact same length, and you'll see how I do the, uh, the dadoing here. Doing them all at once is really the best way because even if I'm off a little bit on the lines, it really won't make a big difference because it'll all go together because if one's off, they're all off, they're all off by the same amount. And in the end, it'll work out just right. 
Uh, it's pretty simple with a crosscut sled, being able to data them all at once, and then I just move it down and cut the next one and so on. Uh, I think probably 10 or 12 cuts here total, and it took us about 15 minutes, so it's, it's uh, took me longer to lay them out than it did to cut all of the dados actually. I think I have a group of six or seven boards together here and those are going to be for the long axis of the table and I'm going to also use another group of six or seven boards, put them together and that'll be for the shorter width of the table, the four foot width and I'll just cut those boards in half after that. So that was pretty straightforward. I'm using three quarter inch plywood for all of these. I'm actually using Baltic birch for the interior. You don't need to use Baltic birch. Uh, we'll get into why I did that here in a little bit, but I, I needed something that was extra strong. But regular plywood would work perfectly for this job. I realized when I was done that I had to trim a little bit off the ends to get them to fit inside of the torsion box, and so that's what I'm doing there. This is the second batch of boards that I cut, and I'm just going to cut these guys in half uh, to make my four foot widths for the inside of the grid that way. And of course I've got to trim that little tail off to the other side. And I've designed it so these are now the perfect length to span the four foot wide interior width of the torsion box. And there we have it. The interior webbing is all dadoed and cut to size and ready to be assembled. The first thing to do is put my very best piece of plywood good side down on top of our strong back because they're building the torsion box upside down and that is going to become the top. Now the fun part, we get to start assembling the grid. This torsion box top assembly table project was actually a request from a number of our Patreon members and actually several viewers as well. Uh, people for quite some time had been asking about my torsion box and how it was built and they asked if I could build a new one and video it and that's what we're doing here. So I do want to say thank you to all of the Patreon members who support our channel. It really helps us out a lot and I'd like to thank all of our viewers and especially those of you who buy some of the merchandise that you need from Amazon, tools and supplies and, and things like that that you find in the descriptions below the videos. Those are affiliate links and uh, Amazon gives our channel a small percentage of that money and, and all of those things really help support our channel. So thank you to everyone for that. Kind of funny here, when I test fit these pieces, they fit together just perfectly, but there was very little margin for error, so now we're having to use a hammer to persuade them into place, but I think that's good. It's going to make for a much stronger structure. In case you were wondering, we are just doing a dry fit of the grid here to make sure everything goes together okay. And I think that's looking pretty good. 10 or 15 gallons of glue and we're going to be all set. After moving the grid out of place, we're going to go ahead and glue down the perimeter boards for the torsion box top.
This is another area where I think it's important to take your time and make sure all of the edges align perfectly flush. Uh, you want to feel them carefully, get them perfectly flush before you clamp them down. And I'm going to even use some squares on the inside to make sure that this, uh, the wall, the edge of the torsion box table is perfectly square to the surface. After getting the two sideboards in place, my daughter's using a damp cloth here and getting all the excess glue off so that we can move to the end boards and we're going to follow the same procedure here. I always like to apply glue to both sides of every joint and that's especially important when one of the two sides is like the end grain of plywood. Uh, it's very absorbent and it will actually absorb and wick and pull some of that glue up into it so it would, could potentially leave us with a glue starved joint so it's important to get glue on both sides. Here again, we want to take our time and make sure that this fits perfectly flush. Now we're going to set the grid back in place and we're going to uh, actually trace around the grid on the inside all the way and pull the grid back out. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to put glue between the tops of this grid where it meets the surface or the inside uh, top board there and I don't know exactly where the glue goes. So if I trace all the way around it and I can lift the grid back out then I can just put a bead of glue in all of those locations and then lower the grid back in place on top of those beads of glue. This is one of those jobs where it would benefit you to get your children or family or friends or somebody out in the shop and help glue all of these up. So the grid is going back in place on top of that glue. I didn't show it on camera, but I did glue the grid back together after we took it apart. And I also put weights on top of this grid to hold it snugly to that top board overnight to glue. And there's the photo bomber. She thinks she's being sneaky, but we all saw her. At this point, I'm going to cut a bunch of scrap wood. I have decided to mount a bench vise to my assembly table and put some bench dogs in. So there's a portion or a section of the table that I want to be solid. I don't want the, uh, the interior grid to be hollow there, so I'm just going to fill it up with scrap wood. I decided to use 2x4s and basically softwood for the most part. Uh, it would be even heavier if I used hardwood, and obviously even with softwood it's going to add some weight to the table, but it's not really that significant. I'm going to do this in the quickest way possible because I don't want to spend all day gluing these things up with a brush. So I'm going to pour a bunch of glue into a pan and sort of dunk the edges of the wood in it in order to get them coated on all six sides and then press them down into place. This does waste glue and you certainly don't have to do this. You could just take your time and brush it on and probably use half of the glue that I used. So that certainly is an option. I think the table overall, beginning to end, took us nearly a gallon of glue and I'm sure that you could get away with a whole lot less glue uh, than that, probably a quart, if you were careful with it. The advantage for us in doing it this way is I think it only took us about 10 minutes. We had three of us doing glue up and we just dunked the pieces in so it went by really fast. And it really only took that long because I decided to have three of these bays glued up because I decided on having really wide jaws for the bench vise and I wanted to have uh, rows of bench dogs out in front of that. So you might make this a little bit narrower. If you did, there'd be less glue up for you. After we let it dry, we just sanded it all down flush so that none of them were sticking above the top of the grid. And uh, we, uh, we took a chisel. I think this is Sai here with the chisel. She's uh, getting the excess glue off of the plywood itself. We're careful not to cut down into the plywood. 
so that when we put the bottom of the torsion box on, it will still glue down securely. And that's what that section looks like when that's all done. I wanted to have power uh, going through the torsion box top so that I can put a power out outlet on each of the four corners. And I had to cut a little channel in the bottom of the grid here in order to get the wire to pass through where this blocking was. If you remember, my torsion box here is upside down and this channel is going through the very bottom of the box and I have it exactly uh, a measured distance back from the edge so I know where the power is. That way when I go to drill the holes, uh, the bench dog holes, it'll be easy for me to avoid that wire in the future. One thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to show you how to wire the electrical boxes themselves. I think that's something that if you're not familiar with, you should have an electrician do. Uh, it's actually a pretty simple project. Maybe you can you know read a book on it, but if, uh, if you're uncomfortable, have an electrician do that part for you. Uh, but I do need to put some holes through the grid now in order to feed this wire around to, to each of the four corners of the box. And if you're replicating my build, I'm actually not using the outermost grid section. I'm running the wire one grid section in all the way around and the power outlet boxes will actually mount one grid section in from each corner. You should be able to see there that I'm actually staying away from that outer row altogether. And the reason for that is because I want to cut some holes on the very outside of this torsion box all the way around the perimeter to kind of have some little cubby holes or pockets to keep our, our cell phones or our keys or screws or things, just small objects to keep them off the, the surface of our table. This is just standard 12-2 Romex wire, normal building wire, and I'm going to wire this into a portion of an extension cord which will mount uh, inside of the table and then the extension cord will ha uh, hang outside and I'll be able to plug that into the wall whenever my table is near a wall. You can see that my daughter Maya has the end of the wire there and she's just going to coil that up and push that down into her corner. And when we drill a hole in the bottom of this torsion box in the future to mount our electrical boxes, uh, we'll, we'll drill it into there and just pull the wire down to wire our outlets. And I'm doing the same with my corner and we'll do that basically for each of the four uh, respective corners of the table. This next step here is an optional step. This is something I am doing to reinforce my table. Um, I am actually going to create some epoxy fillets. So I'm using West Systems two-part epoxy and I'm going to add epoxy filler to it. The epoxy filler is going to, to mix with it and make a very stiff mixture so that it will stay in the corners and it won't run. We continue to add the filler a little bit at a time until you get a consistency that's something like peanut butter that will not run at all. And that's kind of what we're looking for right there. I have a gallon Ziploc bag and I'm putting this filler down into one of the corners and I've cut the very corner of the bag off. 
That will allow me to apply a very thin bead of this epoxy filler to each of the inside corners of my torsion box top. And this is going to effectively glue each of the corners to one another. And this is a tremendously high strength epoxy. So the reason I'm putting these fillets in is because I plan on subjecting my assembly table to some tremendous loading. Quite often I buy plywood a bunk at a time or I buy hardwoods maybe 500 board feet or 1000 board feet at a time and I like to be able to just wheel my whole assembly table here uh, out to my driveway. It kind of acts as a cart and I can load 30 or 40 sheets of plywood on it or load up say 500 board feet of lumber and then wheel it all back into the shop at once. It makes things go fast and it might weigh two or three thousand pounds but it's really no problem when I've got my table beefed up like this and the casters on it are actually rated uh, for 4,800 pounds. So it'll handle that uh, and that's the reason I've reinforced it. In preparation for putting on the top, I'm marking the location of each of these members of the grid and exactly where they show up on the outside piece here because I'm actually going to snap chalk lines across the top to screw the bottom portion of my assembly table onto this portion. I'm going to use glue as well, but now that I know where those grids are, I can actually screw it together too. Once again, this is a great opportunity to get some people out in the shop to help you put this glue on and make it go fast. So after that, we're going to set the bottom in place. And I put a couple of uh, pieces of wood at the corners there so that I don't have to drag the top around and smear the glue and, and get the glue off of those joints. And we'll just pull those out one at a time and lower the top, or the bottom I guess, down into place. We did have to slide it around just a tiny bit to get it into place. When we set it down, it wasn't quite perfect. Once it's lined up perfectly and I get the extra glue off, I'll go ahead and transfer the marks on the side up to the top so that we can draw our grid lines along the bottom uh, piece of the assembly table. The shorter four foot ones I could draw with a straight edge and the longer ones I'm just using a chalk line to snap those straight. We pre-drilled holes about every 12 inches all the way around on all of the grid lines and around the perimeter of the table and put in deck screws to hold that together. The top piece of plywood was very slightly bigger than the bottom piece and that we took all of our measurements off of the bottom piece so it was really no problem. And for the top piece we're just going to use a flush trim bit in our router and trim it perfectly flush to the sides. Okay, torsion box done. Now I want to go around and put my cubby hole pockets in. I have a Milwaukee hole saw that I'm using to cut these out with. And if I cut all the way through one, then I won't be able to go back and cut the other one because the drill bit won't have, won't have the pilot drill bit. There won't be wood there for me to start that hole. So I'm going to do a little bit of one, then a little bit of the other, and just go back and forth until I cut all the way through. The cut is going to be rough, but that's expected. We're going to use some rasps to smooth everything out. I could take a jigsaw in order to flatten those top and bottom portions out so we have a nicer looking opening, but it's just as quick to use my file, or my rasp in this case, and smooth that out to a flat surface. Both my daughters and I tackled this. One of us did the coarse rasp, one did a finer rasp, 
and then the other one followed up with uh, with sandpaper and I think we went through the whole thing with all the holes in about an hour it wasn't too bad So before I flip this torsion box top over, I want to take a quick look and see just how flat it is. So I have a pretty high end box level here and I'm just going to set it flat on the table and look along it and I can't see any light or even pass a piece of paper under it anywhere. And this is an extremely flat level. I think it's guaranteed to uh, uh, five ten thousandths of an inch flatness. Uh, so we did a good job by basically creating a perfectly flat strong back at the beginning. That was the secret to getting this done. And we could not film flipping this thing over onto the tabletop because it was so heavy that all of us had to do it. Even my wife Rupa, who normally does our filming, she had to stop and help us lift this and, and flip it over. I'm guessing it probably weighs maybe 300 pounds. Uh, maybe we used too much glue. I don't know. Okay, here I have slid the top out of the way and I'm going to make some marks and I'm going to cut a portion of this cabinet out right here. The reason I'm doing that is because I need, I need to mount the bench vise to the bottom of the torsion box top. And I don't want this piece of plywood in the way because that just kind of lowers my bench vise effectively. So if I can cut this three quarters of an inch piece out of the way, then I can raise that bench vise up by another three quarters of an inch and it'll probably be a little more effective that way. And I'm not worried about compromising the integrity of the of the cabinet system here because it's screwed in so well everywhere. And we're also going to be screwing this cabinet system up into the torsion box everywhere. So it's going to really be overkill in terms of strength. Now we can slide it back in place and we will go ahead and screw it down. I'm going to screw it down from the bottom and I'm going to go through the cabinets into the top and I'm also going to go through those leg assemblies into the top. So it'll be firmly mounted everywhere. Well I guess I said I am but that's not true. My daughter Maya is actually the one who's under there doing it all for us. And Sai is doing the pre-drilling through the leg assemblies in order to mount it to the torsion box that way. Now we're ready to build our drawers. My preferred material for drawers is half inch Baltic birch. I like Baltic birch because it routes really well. Uh, and most of the drawers that I build I like to use dovetails, half line dovetails and it's just the right thickness and it has plenty of strength so it's a really good wood to use for drawer bodies. I do need to mention however that Baltic birch is certainly not required. Uh, any quality half inch plywood works just fine. You can buy half inch sanded pine plywood from Home Depot and Lowe's I think and that's a pretty good quality plywood as well. It doesn't have the strength or qualities of Baltic birch but it will work fine for drawers the only disadvantage is if you're going to dovetail it is the ends fray more than the Baltic birch ends do and it's a little bit tougher to assemble the dovetails but as long as you're willing to spend the extra time to do it uh, you can certainly do that and you can save some money that way. So Maya is cutting a dado in the bottom of all of these drawer sides. It's slightly wider than half an inch and that'll work perfectly to hold the drawer bottom in place. Once these are done, we're going to move over and cut the dovetails for the drawers. I actually have a video tutorial showing exactly how to cut half blind dovetail drawers. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the description below in case anybody wants to watch it. I'm not really sure how long it is, maybe like 20 minutes or so, but rather than add 20 minutes to this video, and reteach the same thing over again. I'm just going to go ahead and quickly cut these 
and we'll move on with this project. But you should know that there there is one available, a complete and comprehensive tutorial to show you exactly how to cut these dovetails step by step. And even if you've never cut dovetails before, after that tutorial, you should be able to cut dovetails just fine. It's actually not really very hard. It's just a matter of getting the procedure just right. I'll touch on some of the highlights that help to cut good dovetails. And one of those keys is to just lightly score the edge first before you go in and cut the dovetails. Especially with plywood, this goes a long way to help prevent fraying and edge tear out on plywood dovetails. And then after I run the router through one pass, I like to run it through again and make sure I got all of the dovetails cut properly. And here again, this is also a good thing to do with plywood because sometimes the plywood will, little, little flakes might bend or move out of the way and not cut cleanly off and you'll have difficulty assembling it. But if you take this second pass through the plywood, usually, you, usually you'll end up with much cleaner uh, dovetails and your drawers will be much easier to assemble. My older daughter, Maya, cut these and she did a really good job. But you should know when you cut dovetails, half blind dovetails like this, if they don't look perfect, it really doesn't matter. They can be chipped, flaked, little bits broken off, and your drawer will go together just fine and be plenty strong. They're not always going to look perfect. Now we gotta cut the drawer bottoms. This is something that I usually wait to cut until after I do a dry fit of the drawer body itself and double check my measurements and make sure it worked out just right. All we have to do now is just glue up and assemble the drawers. I like to put glue the same on these as with everything. I like to glue both sides of every joint and you know it often takes an extra minute or so to uh, clean up the squeeze out later but you're left with joints that are perfectly glued together and will last a lifetime. Once you put glue on a half blind joint, if it's cut right, it usually does take a mallet in order to get it to go together. But that has its advantages. There's a pretty tight friction fit, and once I assemble these drawers, I do not clamp them. They really hold together under their own force really well. I just make sure they're square before I set them down to dry. So after we get three sides assembled, I usually flip it upside down and then we go ahead and put the bottom in. And I don't bother to glue the bottom in, it's not really necessary. The drawer itself holds together really well without that. And there, some people say you don't glue the bottom in because of expansion and contraction. That's actually a non-issue with this plywood. Uh, because plywood doesn't expand and contract. And if it does, it's, it's so minuscule, it's completely irrelevant. I think Maya was getting a little aggressive with that mallet there. Maybe we should have given her the bigger one for this. It only takes a minute to clean off that extra squeeze out and this drawer is done. After a quick square check, we'll just stack it over with our other drawers and move on to the next step. Now that is going to give us some much needed storage in the shop. And that all fits under the assembly table. Okay, time to install these drawers. 
We're gonna cut some spacers. These are kind of like dividers to divide up the drawer areas. That just helps us put the drawers in place. These aren't absolutely necessary, but they're pretty easy to put in. And I like to put them because I think it makes mounting drawers easier. It does make the cabinet body stronger, but clearly in this case, it's not really necessary. Maya is using those two spacer boards to get the exact height for this divider. And then she's gonna clamp the divider in place and proceed to pocket screw it in. After that, she can just move up to the next level and do the same thing. If you decide that you want to build this project, of course, all of these dimensions and exact locations are included in the 3D plans that we have uh, for sale. And there's a link to those in the description below. So next, Maya is going to install these ball bearing drawer slides. The easiest way to do that is to cut a spacer block, uh, the exact height up from the bottom that you want the drawer slides to be, and rest the drawer slide on it. We pre-drill the holes, and then we put the screws in for the drawer slide. Each slide takes about four to five screws in order to get maximum strength out of it. Uh, there are more slots in there, and they're there in case you mess up one of the holes or strip it out, you can put another screw in. And also for the pre-drill, it's a good idea to use these VIX bit. It's V-I-X VIX bit. It's a self-centering bit. If you put that into the hole where the screw's gonna go, it will drill a hole right to the dead center of that. For one of the sections where we would have one of those spacers, we're gonna go ahead and cut a full width shelf. The reason for that is this shelf is going to go underneath where the bench vise will mount and I won't really be able to open a drawer underneath there, but I should be able to access that shelf for storage. And that's pretty simple. Uh, installing drawer slides is a pretty fast operation. As long as you have your spacer blocks cut, it doesn't take but a couple of minutes uh, to install a pair of them. And I think there were 15 total drawers in this, so we probably wrapped up in 35 or 45 minutes. Now to mount the drawers. We start off with a spacer, something like a 1 8 of an inch spacer block, on top of our dividers. That'll keep the drawer from ever dragging along the divider. And we'll just push the drawer in about 3 quarters or, or 7 eighths of the way. Uh, pull the drawer slide, the front of the drawer slide, out. We'll drill a hole and put the first screw in. We'll do the same thing on the other side and we'll gradually just keep pulling the drawer out further and putting in the screws as we go. It's actually pretty simple to do that and as long as you keep it held flat against the spacers as you pull it all the way out, then your drawer will go in and out nicely, just like this one did. Well, that's going to wrap up this video, and I hope you will join us next video to see some of the funnest part of this whole build. Thanks for watching.